Welcome on this Holy Week Tuesday as we reflect on Jesus' journey to the cross. And we're going to begin with a prayer. Let's pray together. Loving God, we come before you in worship and praise, thanksgiving and remembrance. We come recalling that last week of Jesus' life. Reflect upon all that it teaches us about him, about his faithfulness to the last, about his willingness to take the way to the cross, of what it teaches us of his courage in the face of rejection and opposition, suffering and death. We come, Lord, consecrating our lives to your service, committing ourselves to your cause. Open our hearts, Lord, to your presence. Receive now this time of worship that we offer to you and speak through it to us so that we may grow in faith and be strengthened in your service. For we ask this in your name. Amen. I'm going to hear now a reading from Mark's Gospel. It's a reading which tells us of the parable that Jesus told about the, the tenants in a vineyard. Let's hear that now. A reading from Mark chapter 12, verses 1 to 12. The parable of the tenants. Jesus then began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it dug a pit for the wine press and built a tower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. At harvest time he sent a servant to the tenants to collect from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. But they seized him, beat him and sent him away empty-handed. Then he sent another servant to them. They struck this man on the head and treated him shamefully. He sent still another, and that one they killed. He sent many others, some of them they beat, others they killed. He had one left to send, a son whom he loved. He sent him last of all, saying, They will respect my son. But the tenants said to one another, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they took him and killed him, and threw him out of the vineyard. What then will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and kill those tenants, and give the vineyard to others. Haven't you read this passage of scripture? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvellous in our eyes. Then the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders looked for a way to arrest him because they knew he had spoken the parable against them. But they were afraid of the crowd, so they left him and went away. What an eclectic mix of emotions our journey through Holy Week evokes if we follow Jesus' journey and become involved in and part of the story. It's a real roller coaster of events which takes place leading up to Jesus' death on a cross. Jesus told this parable about a landowner. It was about a vineyard and some tenants and Mark gives us the context of this. Jesus had entered Jerusalem on a donkey to a crowd who were, well, they were chanting scripture. They apparently recognised him as the saviour. He was the fulfilment of Old Testament prophecy. And that's a wonderful scene of delighted people, full of hope, praising their king, riding on a donkey, or a colt perhaps. John writes that the chief priests voiced concern they said that the whole world seems to be behind him. Mark tells us that the following day the priestly gathering were further dismayed when Jesus cleared the temple. Mark tells us in the same chapter that Jesus cursed a barren fig tree for not bearing fruit. In the passage we've just heard, Jesus tells a parable about a vineyard. 
Well, fig trees first and vines second. There's no mention of any fruit on either of those plants. We need to understand the context and we need to try and crack the codes that Jesus uses. These are the final days leading up to Jesus' arrest and execution. Just as the days that we are living in, these last days of March 2021, they are the days that we call Holy Week and we're counting down to Good Friday. The fig tree and the vineyard, well they're both metaphors for the people of Israel. The tower that the land owner has been said to have built is seen as the temple and the wine press is viewed as being the altar. The wall around the vineyard is believed to be the law. The tenants, well the tenants are those who have been entrusted with the care of the kingdom. The man who planted the vineyard and gave the resources to bear fruit, well that man is God. And if we read on through the chapter, Mark will describe Jesus' teaching about the end times before he shares the bread and wine with his disciples and then he goes to the cross for our sake. We're always invited to see ourselves in the parables that Jesus tells us. We might see ourselves as the tenants. We might possibly see ourselves among the servants, those who are sent by the man who owns the vineyard. Or perhaps as Jesus intended, we see these people, the servants, as the prophets of old, who were not listened to, who were often beaten and sometimes killed. Jesus is recorded saying in Mark and sorry in Matthew's Gospel, chapter twenty three, he says these words Jerusalem, O Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you. How often have I longed to gather you together, as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Maybe we can identify more with the one who has rejected the son, the landowner's son, the son of God. The cornerstone of our church, of our faith. Well, Jesus' reference to the cornerstone who is rejected, that's the son. That comes from Isaiah chapter 5, verse 7. Isaiah both prophesied that the Messiah would come and he prophesied that he would be rejected by the religious authorities. Jesus, we know, is that cornerstone, rejected by the priests and the teachers and the elders. Now when Jesus tells a parable, he often um, offers a, an explanation to his listeners about what is the parable about. The listeners on this occasion, well, they're the priests, the elders and the teachers of the law. They don't need to be told who they are in the parable. It's obvious to them. Hence their response in verse 12. We're told that when that group of people heard the parable, the priests, teachers and elders, they looked for a way to have Jesus arrested. Jesus' rejection, though prophesied, should not be viewed as being inevitable. He tried in his earthly minister to gather them in like a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. Jesus didn't tell the parable to the priests and leaders to condemn them. He didn't do it to provoke them either. He offered them yet another opportunity to see the truth, the truth of who he is. They chose rejection. Now I invite you to imagine yourself in Jesus' position sent to save but rejected by those he had created the people he had breathed life into imagine you yourself as jesus journey towards the pain of maundy thursday's betrayal the pain of good friday's denial and friendless execution on a cross can you imagine the immensity of that well no of course you can't it's a horror beyond the capacity of human imagination. It is far too horrific to contemplate yourself 
in that position. So where's the good news in this? Well, I suggest that the good news is in knowing that Jesus, the cornerstone who was rejected, he doesn't need to imagine the way we feel when we suffer rejection because he's already experienced rejection way above anything we can imagine. Jesus suffered that rejection to the point of death, even death on a cross. Now I've heard it said that the feeling of rejection by a loved one is the deepest of all hurts. By some it's described as being equal to or even beyond the pain experienced by bereavement. I have no way of knowing if that's true, fortunately. But what I do know is that Jesus took those hurts for us. And I know that whatever our hurt is, Jesus understands it. And he has compassion for us because he's experienced it first. I invite you to just to take a moment now to reflect on the suffering of Christ that he went through as he was rejected by the creatures he created. And I invite you to take any hurt that you've experienced, take it to him and ask him to carry that hurt. And in doing so, I ask you, I invite you to ask Jesus to carry the hurt of the whole world and to show his compassion and his love for the people he has created. I invite you to do that as we listen to the hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. Come. 
we close with our prayers of intercession. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, once more, we remember that last week before you faced the cross. We recall your pain and hurt as you faced, faced betrayal, denial, rejection and abandonment. We confess that we have added to your pain through our thoughts, words and action. Through our lack of thought, our failure to speak and our reluctance to act. So many times we have denied the faith and love we declare. We've cared too much for the good opinion of others. We've been fearful to contemplate the true cost of discipleship. Like lost sheep, we have gone astray. Yet, Lord, you've called us to be your church. You have forgiven us. You've cleansed and restored us given your own life for our sake. So, Lord, receive our thanks. Receive our praise. And help us to follow you more faithfully. For in your name we pray. Lord, we bring to you the troubles of your world. You, Lord, are aware of all of the suffering in your world. Those who are rejected because of colour, race, sexual orientation or gender. You know those whose love has been responded to with indifference or even hatred. We pray for all who suffer any form of need this night. In the silence we bring those needs before you as we remember your suffering too. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And now, Lord, we ask your blessing upon us this night. The blessing of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be with us now and for evermore. Amen. Go in peace. The God of peace goes with you. Amen.